is changing dramatically now with 150 channels that might be available in the near future. There's a lot of things that we do that you couldn't have on network television. People are really trying to do something adventurous. Channel 7, shame on you! TV has a detrimental, damaging, developmental effect on our young people. Now, now who is that? Excellence is hard. It's very rare, which is why there are very few good shows, and those that are good stand out. Hold on, buddy. Hold <laughs> that was cool. year never end? When the 90s begin, we're starting to see a lot of experimentation. <laughs> and The Simpsons, I think in some senses, was inspired by a, not necessarily a hatred of television, but a distrust of a lot of the ways in which television was talking to us. TV respects me. It laughs with me, not at me. <laughs> you stupid... <laughs> I think the sitcoms of the 80s I love you guys were such a sort of warm, safe humor. Oh, oh, you see, the kids, they listen to the rap music, which gives them the brain damage. And I think there was a real yearning for another type of humor. We were able to spoof fatherhood. What a bad father. Which, at the time, and I stress, at the time, was Bill Cosby as the shining example. Did you ever know that you're my hero? The stuff they got away with because it's a cartoon. The father strangling the child. Are you little? <laughs> we are going to keep on trying to strengthen the American family to make American families a lot more like the Waltons and a lot less like the Simpsons. Huh? We go to a completely bizarre period of time in 1992 when a sitting president is raging against a sitcom. They have dealt with politics, they've dealt with popular culture, they've dealt with all kinds of issues of racism, of sexism. Don't ask me, I'm just a girl. <laughs> right on, say it, sister. It's not funny, Bart. Millions of girls will grow up thinking that this is the right way to act. They have found a way to talk about everything that's going on in our lives through the filter of The Simpsons. Them immigrants, they want all the benefits of living in Springfield, but they ain't even bothered to learn themselves the language. Yeah, those are exactly my sentimonies. Yeah, what the fuck up? I think one of the governing things that's happening with The Simpsons is a distrust of anyone who tells us that we should trust them and doesn't earn that trust. Oh, and uh, I'll take that Statue of Justice, too. Sold! And when they make fun of how Fox works. You are watching Fox. We are watching Fox. They're telling you, don't trust us either. Eat my shorts. All right, I'll eat, eat your shorts. The Simpsons is like Shakespeare in the sense that we quote The Simpsons all the time, very often without even knowing it. Excellent. I wish I could create something that culturally indelible. It's unlike anything else TV's ever wrought. Twin Peaks showed up out of nowhere at the beginning of the decade, and the pilot episode of that was one of the strangest and most exciting things I've ever seen. Diane, I'm at the Twin Peaks County Moor with the body of the victim. What's her name? Laura Palmer. It was incredible. I mean, just how slowly in the beginning the news spread around this little town that this young, beautiful girl had died. And that 
haunting music was so dark and so beautiful. What on earth is essentially a art film doing in primetime television? American network television has long been considered the home of the bland, the cautious and the predictable. So it was with some trepidation that the ABC network recently launched a new series that was none of those things. Twin Peaks has already been described by one critic as the series that will change TV. It's directed by David Lynch. David Lynch was a filmmaker known for his taste in the eccentric and memorable. The idea that he would do network television in the 90s was crazy. Do you watch much of it? Well, I, I, I like uh, the idea of television, but I'm too busy to see very much of it. And I, what do you think of that which you do see on television? Well, um, some of it I, you know, I really uh, enjoy. Are you being diplomatic? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful thing about television is you have uh, the chance to do a continuing story, and that's the main reason, you know, for doing it. I think that Twin Peaks, with the initial attention that it got, allowed all the other networks to say, let's do something different. The day's coming, and it ain't gonna be long when you ain't even gonna have to leave your living room. No more schools, no more bodegas, no more tabernacles, no more cineplexes, all right? You're gonna snuggle up to your fiber optics, baby, and bliss out. You could sense these successful creators trying to see how they could do things different than they'd done five or 10 years ago. Sometimes that led to really challenging network television that was cool and fun to watch, and sometimes it just seemed to fall off the edge a little bit. At the time, Stephen Bochco was a very successful producer of our dramas and wanted to try something brand new. This is the police! We have a warrant for your arrest! Here, here, here. And so his idea was to combine a gritty cop show with a Broadway musical. I saw one in which a bunch of gangbangers were in jail and they began to sing, Life in the hood ain't no pizza pie. Everybody die when the bullets fly. And I'm saying, wait a minute, hold on, wait a minute. And I thought, well, this is it. This is going to be great. This is going to be as innovative as anything I've ever done. He's guilty, Judge, he's guilty. You could see it in his eyes. He did the crime and now he's got to pay. <laughs> I mean, it just... It circled the drain. I'm creatively proud of it, still. You know, I'm very glad that we tried it. Um, I don't think I'd want to do it again. The following movie is rated R. In 1990, 91, there was not a whole lot of original programming for cable, but they were airing movies. So we needed to compete, and I felt that if we didn't, we were going to, you know, kind of get swept out. Oh, yes, son of a bitch. And so I came up with the notion of doing a cop show that was R rated. When ABC's broadcast standards read our script, they went berserk. I was sitting with a pad and a pencil drawing pictures of breasts to try to show them what, what we would show and what we wouldn't show. I had grown up sitting in a room, you know, doodling. Then we started on the language. We heard some reporter called the low-life asshole third pimp with the brains of a flea and the balls of a moth. The program premiered with an advertising boycott. But it was such an immediate hit, that boycott lasted, oh, four weeks. They could use the nudity and the curse words to go deeper into the actual emotional burden of being a cop. I'm an asshole. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an asshole. And it had this character, Andy Sipowitz. He's raging alcoholic, racist, sexist, violent. Hey! 
He created the TV antihero. You know, I know that great the African-American George Washington Carver discovered the peanut, but can you provide names and addresses of these friends? You know, you're a racist scumbag. Despite his flaws, despite his prejudices, I think people identified with his pain. I wish there was a way to say this that wouldn't hurt you, Mr. Wentz. There's a famous early episode where they're investigating the rape and murder of a young boy, and they find a homeless child molester who murdered the kid, and Sipowitz, to get the confession, has to be, like, very sensitive and very good cop. I know this has got to be tearing you up inside, but you're going to feel a lot better if you just tell the truth. You can sort of see on Dennis Franz's face, this is killing him to not, like, destroy this guy right now. And finally, he, he gets the confession, he gets a signed statement. He walks out of the room, he goes to another interrogation room, and he breaks the door in two with his fists. <laughs> and I'm choking up talking about it right now, because like that's how great a moment of TV that it is. 20 years from now, the best TV dramas, what do they look like? I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know will whether- Will they be bolder than what we see today? Oh, assuredly. Assuredly, they will be. The 90s gave us several shows that didn't really explode in the ratings, but were very influential to other people making television. Homicide is one of them. Tell me with questions all night. I'm living in a danger zone. Homicide Life on the Street was really innovative in terms of its style. It used music in ways that advanced the narrative. And it also used feature film directors that brought a look and style to the show that really stood out on television. Tears coming out of your eyes. There ain't no tears coming from my eyes. His eyes are brimming with tears. They had so many African-American characters in the cast that on several occasions, they were the only people on camera interacting with one another. And that sounds like so. But as late as the 90s, that wasn't done on television. When a cop shoots somebody, he stands by it. He picks up the radio mic and he calls it in. He stands by the body. If not, cops are no better than anybody else. In the 90s, television was getting more complicated. Stories were starting to become more episodic. Characters were starting to develop and change. None of that happened on Law & Order. This was a show that completely delivered on its formula every time. You get a crime. All right, let's roll. You got the investigation into the crime. You better be packing more than a dirty mouth. You got an arrest. Hey, what's the charge? Hey, I'm asking you a question. What's the charge? Oh, there's no charge. This one's on us. And then you had a trial. He's badgering, Your Honor. Sit down and shut up, Mr. Feynman. Overruled. And you will address the court from now on, Mr. McCoy. And so every time you watched, you got what you came for. Tell me, doctor. All those women you ran through your examination rooms? Do you remember their faces, or did you not even bother to look up? You had in Law & Order the kinds of characters that people take to heart. I'll let you take me lunch. One time after. And if you're an actor and you say, well, gee, you know, maybe, maybe it's not really such a bad medium after all. Miranda, Bartolomeo, the Supreme Court's Minnick decision. The whole thing's illegally obtained. They were both represented by counsel. You just get hooked in. It's life and death and stuff. We know what you did. Counsel! Okay, you hear me, Ryan? Do you hear me? I'll have your client you hear me? What you mean? Do you hear me, Katana? Law and order was like crack. <laughs> You'd have to sit and watch me for 50 minutes, just like... not moving, barely breathing. There are times I've almost passed out watching... Law and order. He, he, Carter, get over here. I need your help. The ER had originally been written as a movie for Steven Spielberg to direct. And so we had this two-hour piece, which was a reflection of, of Michael's experiences as a medical student. Use an angiocath with a 16 needle. You need a large bore in case they're bleeding and you need to transfuse them. Do you know how to start an IV? Uh, actually, no. ER is a hospital show, but it's really an action movie. Ah! Wounded, yellow urgent, red critical, and black healing. Got it, got it. A gurney comes in, people are shouting instructions, climbing up onto the body and like doing CPR, and suddenly they're racing off to the surgical suite. Get that gurney out of there! Someone wanders in, they're tossing around medical jargon. CPC, type and hold two units. They don't stop to explain what it is. You know, prep for a peritoneal lavage. I think I know what that is now, but only because I watched a lot of ER over the years. Need a plural lavage? 
could try, but I don't think his heart would take it. We bypass him and warm his blood directly. That'd be the fastest way. What do you think? You're the attending. There was so much information coming at you that I think it made the experience feel as if you had to watch it in the same way that you would watch a film, that you had to stay involved in it the whole time. Come on, Ben, you can make... Hold on, buddy. Hold on. There was a lot of research that said that people didn't want to watch anybody have anything other than a happy outcome. It's not flatline, it's fine V-fib. Another seven makes epi. And we argued that that wasn't really showing what the world was for physicians. I had unbelievable amount of respect for the people who did this because I understood how human they were. Can you sing the um, theme song from Cheers? Cheers, yeah. How does it start? Making your way in the world today. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, come on, I know, I know, but it's cute, come on, just sing it. Takes everything you got. Taking a break from all your worries sure can help a lot. When you like to get away, sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. We decided to end Cheers in the 11th year, and uh, over 93 million people watched the finale of Cheers. But it's a sad experience for everybody. This was our baby for 11 years, and we're not going to be around these people every day. You people are as dear to me as my own family. We had been serving fake suds forever. It was time for everybody to sip. In fact, I was sipping along with them. The time goes by so fast. People move in and out of your life. You must never miss an opportunity to tell these people how much they mean to you. We had been through so much together. You spend that much time with a, a, the same set of people, it does become your family. I feel pretty lucky to have the friends I do. I think the legacy of Cheers is our need to belong. And I think that's what we as Americans are longing for. Thank you, guys. The final scene of Cheers was really, what was Sam's real first love? You can never be unfaithful to your one true love. I'm the luckiest son of a bitch on earth. And his real first love was the bar. Sorry, we're closed. How big a loss is this for NBC anyway? Well, Katie, I'm still here, and I'm waiting for the cast members to come back, so okay. I'd say it's a pretty big loss. Out of the sad, sad sorrow and being scared to death that I would very quickly lose my job, I was like, what are we going to do? TV is changing dramatically now with up 150 channels that might be available in the near future. There are more choices than ever before, and it's a tough job. You, you have to try and get a sense of what is the mm -hmm. audience going to really make an attachment to. In the 90s, cable was coming on strong. So we had to examine who are we going to be? Well, we wanted to be smart, sophisticated comedy. Six months ago, I was living in Boston. My wife had left me, which was very painful. Then she came back to me, which was excruciating. Well, you know, I thought Frazier was dead with cheers. <laughs> but what we thought, we got a built-in audience and great potential for, you know, building out the character to another place. No! <laughs> Frazier was kind of like one-act plays. Mother and I moved here when I was a small boy after the tragic death of my father. I kept the pain of that loss buried deep within me like a serpent coiled within a damp cave. Okay, that's it. We always assumed the audience was smarter than most other people did, and we played to that. She is just unschooled, like Liza Doolittle. Oh. You'll find her the right Henry Higgins. She'll be ready for a ball in no time. <laughs> Leave it to you to put the pig back in Pygmalion. Thank you. Kelsey Grammer played pomposity like nobody you've ever seen and got huge laughs. It's not considered a move until my fingers have completely cleared the piece. Well, what's taking so long? Well, I am analyzing my options. Unlike your winged approach, I like to plan a strategy, like a general leading his troops into battle. 
Checkmate, Schwarzkopf. I think Frasier probably stands as the single most successful spin-off, at least in the history of sitcoms. And the Emmy goes to... Frasier! 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 At the height of must-see TV, Thursday nights on NBC, 75 million Americans watched Thursday night. That was, at the time, one-third of the country. Ooh! What is this stuff? The sweater, it's Angora. Well, it's wonderful. The machine that was NBC in the 90s for comedy was untouchable. You're not from around here, are you? It generated so much viewership and money and awards. We do not need this. It's the top of our wedding cake. We're not, it, this, it, it's not a scrapbook, it's a freezer. No! We certainly associate NBC of the 90s with having extremely successful sitcoms, but they weren't the only network that found their way to having some success. TGIF was on ABC on Friday, and it was their block of family-oriented comedies. I can't take it. I need the cake. <laughs> it was not sophisticated television, but these were shows that people adored. <laughs> CBS. CBS was in a really bad spot. They had just fallen apart over the early part of the 90s, and they'd gone through a couple different network executives. <laughs> but then suddenly they had this hit with an unknown comic. This was the era of Seinfeld, no hugging, no learning. And this was a show being made as if it was produced in the era of the Dick Van Dyke show. I love you. There was hugging, there was learning. I love you, son. All right. If you worked for me, your job was to go home, get in a fight with your wife, and come back in and tell me about it. Don't sleep on the couch. I just cleaned down there. In fact, the pilot, I put in this true thing that happened to me wherein I sent my parents a gift for the holidays of the Fruit of the Month Club. And did you know you sent me a box of pears? Yeah, yeah. From a place called Fruit of the Month? That's right, that's right. How are they? And my mother reacted as if I had sent her a box of heads from a murderer. Why did you oh throw this to me? God. I can't talk to you. It's Fruit of the House. Oh, what is happening? What do you think we are, invalids? Oh. We can't go out and get our own fruit? I'm trying to tell them. All right, I'm canceling the fruit club. The real story is where the real connection with your audience is. Thank God, all your families are crazy too. Looks like you got the whole family together. Yeah, yeah, it's dysfunction palooza. A new era of technology and competition is forcing network news operations to re-examine the way they do business. New owners spent billions buying the networks recently. GE buying NBC, Capital Cities, ABC, and Lowe's Tisch Brothers buying CBS. And all of them want their money's worth. We'll now have the strongest network. We'll have a stronger defense piece. This is going to be one dynamite company. There's a danger that news will be mixed up with the rest of television and considered just another profit center. Late 1920s, early 1930s to the early 1980s, the sense was, we'll give some of the broadcasting time to public service. But in the 1990s, journalism in the country changed a great deal. You couldn't talk about public service. It was, what are the ratings going to be? What are the demographics going to be? What is the profit going to be? Well, sensationalism sells. In a plea bargain, 18-year-old Amy Fisher got up to 15 years in prison for shooting the wife of her alleged lover. So intense is the interest in this case that there are three, three made-for-TV movies now in the works about it. You make money off sex, you make money off death, you make money off crime. The press calls the case the Beverly Hills Mansion Murders, and the story reads like one of the unsold scripts that circulate here in Hollywood. We enter into the world of the television news soap opera. A story of basic instincts, anger and fear. I was scared and uh, I just wanted him to leave me alone. And so broadcast journalism loses its purity and it becomes much more shoddy, sensationalistic. And then it all comes together with O.J. Simpson. I'm Larry Carroll in Los Angeles. The Los Angeles County District Attorney has just filed murder charges against Arinthal James O.J. Simpson. Uh, okay, I'm going to have to interrupt this call. I understand we, we're going to go to a live picture in Los Angeles. 
Police believe that that O.J. Simpson is in that car. The O.J. Simpson story starts with the chase and then goes on to his arrest and then culminates with the trial, which goes on and on and on and is televised day after day after day. This is going to be a long trial. There's a lot of evidence to come in. The O.J. Simpson case was such a national phenomenon that those of us who were covering it just lived this case 24 hours a day because there was so much demand for people talking about it. As Simpson struggled to slide the gloves onto his hands and turned toward jurors saying, they're too small, prosecutors were incensed. The trial was on television during the hours that had traditionally been the time for soap operas. He appears to have pulled the gloves on, counsel. And O.J. was very much a soap opera. He's impeached by his own witness. And I ask that you put a stop to it. Either Mr. put Bailey. Cordoba on the Excuse stand me, Mr. or Bailey. stop her from Stand telling up and speak when it's your turn. No question that the best TV show of the 90s was the O.J. Simpson trial, and everybody on it was riveting. NBC News in depth tonight, the Simpson trial finally winding to a close. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, or Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A. The verdict of the O.J. Simpson trial? viewed by 150 million people. It's more people than watch presidential election returns. That's crazy. Because there was trial footage every day, CNN saw its audience increase like five times. The success of CNN was not lost on other people. And so there were competing forces coming into play. How delighted I am that we've now reached this moment when we can firmly announce uh, the starting of a Fox News Channel. Unfortunately, with, with cable news and the ability or the need to be on the air 24-7, where you're trying to get as many eyeballs as possible at one time, to gravitate toward those stories that are sensational, you know, it brought us the ability to go too far. Is the Jean Benet Ramsey murder investigation turning into a media circus? Yes, it's tabloid, but on the other hand, it's a tabloid era. And here's the point, here's where the fear comes into it, I think, Larry. It's the fear that says, gosh, if we don't cover it big time, our competition is, and when they cover it big time, they're gonna get a big jump in the ratings, and the first thing is to last. If we're gonna last, if we're gonna survive, we gotta do it. What you also see is a whole army of commentators, people who make their business talking about the news. What I say is what we should do is we should bomb his capability of producing oil. Take out his refineries, his stations, his wells. They don't wells. have any capability of well, producing oil. Well, they're certainly oil. selling a lot of oil no, to the The not. networks were doing good journalism, but they became much more preoccupied by profits. It's much cheaper to have someone in your studio pontificating uh, than to have reporters out in the field reporting. I don't know if any of this is true. But what I've heard is that the father went down, uh, opened this basement room, which the FBI had bypassed. Every single sentence on, on CNN, perhaps on CNBC, on Fox, on MSNBC, begins with the words, I think. But after a while, people get confused by what is speculation, by what is innuendo, by what is fact. And as far as the viewer is concerned, be very, very careful of unsubstantiated information presented with great hype. In the mid-1990s, if you took a look at the list of the 50 most watched shows on cable, at the top would be Nickelodeon, Rugrats, Blue's Clues, don't you know cartoons will ruin your mind? Ren and Stimpy had some very surreal, high-concept humor to it. And this is the beginning of the splintering of the television audience and the splintering of the family audience, really. I mean, because with families having three or four TVs in the house, you had a kid watching Nickelodeon, you had the dad watching ESPN Sports, you had the mom watching Lifetime. You know, they were in their own separate universes watching television. By the time of the 90s, MTV wasn't merely a music channel. They were having great success in terms of creating shows that incorporated music, but that also were shows and programs that stood on their own. Yes! 
<laughs> that was cool. <laughs> Certainly Beavis and Butthead sort of established what MTV could be because the show was about people making fun of music videos, just like people in the audience were doing. Whoa. Check out his neck. There's like all these bones and stitches moving around. My manager would call me like, hey, you got this big bump as you were on Beavis and Butthead last night. And I sit there just like a donut watching these guys. <laughs> That's now, what it's for. Yeah. And, and I find them endlessly entertaining because I know and you know and the world knows these guys are, always will be, and cannot be anything but idiots. That's right. MTV has a detrimental, damaging developmental effect on the sexuality, on the morality, on the spirituality, on the maybe even the physical development of our young people. Now we hit the 90s and once you can go for an audience of 5 million and have a successful show, you can say, I don't care if the parents don't like this. Can I tell you something, Miss Ellen? Of course, Wendy. Don't f*** with me. What? You heard me. Stay away from my man, bitch. Or I'll whoop your sorry ho ass back to last year. Trey Parker and Matt Stone were two of the funniest people I ever met. And their success story is proof that if you just stay true to yourself, you don't have to do anything else. People think, oh, you came and did this show and now you're big sellouts. The truth is, I mean, we were sellouts to begin with. Perhaps there is no stopping the corporate machine. I mean, we were sleeping at friends' houses, had no money, and then one Fox executive had seen a cartoon we had made in college. He said, make me another Christmas video that I can send out as a Christmas card. And, you know, he gave us like 700 bucks and we went and made this five minute short. I come seeking retribution. He's come to kill you because you're Jewish, Kyle. Oh. It went around the TV community like wildfire. I mean, it, it was the funniest thing you'd ever seen in your life. Go, Santa! Somebody showed me the short. Go, GJ! I thought it was hysterical. So I called and said, get them in here right away. Oh my God, they killed Kenny! You bastards! South Park was able to be topical. Just call me your old pal, Saddam Hussein. South Park really, really detests hypocrites. Christians and Republicans and Nazis, oh my! Well, okay, Mrs. Cartman, I'll legalize 40th trimester abortions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine back then that these people would ever get on network television? Or any kind of television? <gasps> it's a miracle. South Park is a miracle. The early 90s, the HBO shows start to kind of uh, come into their own. Now, now, Dan, have I always had these, these breasts? <laughs> A lot of people want freedom. They don't want to go back to the networks, which are saying you can come to us where you'll make more money, but you also have content restricted. You could go to cable and have no restrictions, not make as much money, but have freedom of expression, which almost everybody who works in these mediums wants. Some of the content truly was, you can't get this anywhere else. Here at Fantasy Makers, the only limit on the kinds of fantasies is people's imagination. White people don't trust black people. That's why they won't vote for no black president. Like a black brother will f the White House. Like the grass won't be cut. Dishes piled up, cousins running through the White House, cookouts, basketball goal in the back. In the late 80s, HBO was just sort of gaining ground for series. By the 90s, HBO had started to begin its explosion. When we started doing Dream On, one of the things that HBO said to us was, <coughs> it's got to be something that couldn't be on network TV. That was shocking, even for us as, as writers who created it. We were like, oh my God, we can really? What do you want, baby? Tell me what you want. I want what? You want what? I want what? I've never done that. Call 911. You've watched Letterman, you've watched Leno, but what about Larry? Larry Sanders, that is. 
He's the TV alter ego of comedian Gary Shandling. Gary Shandling wanted to do a show that deconstructed the kind of show that The Tonight Show was. Just uh, pretend like you're talking to me until we're off the air so it won't seem weird. Okay. Uh, so. Blah, 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 blah. The Larry Sanders Show was sort of cathartic because in the world of The Larry Sanders Show, there was a network. You want me to with your budget? Is that what you want me to do? So it became this weird funhouse mirror thing where you could use stuff from your misery from your career as fodder. Now don't take this as a threat, but I killed a man like you in Korea, hand to hand. My boy doesn't want to do any more commercials. Larry Sanders to me was, you know, aside from being a brilliant television show. Can you say, uh... Hey now. hey now! It was my everyday life. I'm here for three good reasons. Last show, big ratings, movie coming out. Bim, bam, boom. The Larry Sanders Show was very unique in that it was very deadpan and really groundbreaking in its day. I think it made people really go, that's the level of work you may be able to do on a cable network. Oz comes on in 97, and it's set in this fictional penitentiary. Wow, what a strange show that was. In Oz, sometimes the things you can't touch are more real than the things you can. For instance, fear, hatred, loneliness are more real to me than a shank and a soul. It was jaw-droppingly violent. Um, it was a men's prison, it probably should be, but, you know, it, it kind of announces the idea that HBO is going to get very serious about doing scripted dramas. It's finished! It's over! But HBO really, in my mind, comes into its own in 1999 with The Sopranos. Sopranos just as a, one of those shows that was a benchmark, it changed like a lot of things for everybody. Throw out the handbook. Tony Soprano, the lead actor in a drama, he killed a man. We watched him on a college tour. Pretty, huh? Yeah. It was just a melding of a guy and a world. <laughs> and a behavior that promoted all of the feelings that you would have for a guy that you love in a guy that you hate, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Sopranos came on TV, and it really showed us the future, whether we realized that was going to be the future of television or not. Uh, this husband of yours, Carmella, how much we love him. Mwah. He's the best. Oh. <laughs> He's like a father to me. <laughs> Just make sure nothing happens to him. That character in that show was a great inspiration to a great many shows that came after it, including uh, one that I worked on. You know what I want, Tony? I want those kids to have a father. They got one. This one. Me. Tony Soprano. And all that comes with it. Oh, you prick. Because of the quality of those shows that happened in the 90s, actors no longer felt that it was a come down to come work in television audiences started to look towards television for what they had only found before in feature film. What did I ever do to you except deliver the sound? You shouldn't have made me beg. Network dramas became very innovative. They were really making a new mark. Once we started making the kinds of shows that we were making in the 90s, you couldn't shut the door on them. Get me out. The 90s is an amazing decade of TV. Some of my favorite shows of all time aired in that decade, and everybody was watching them. There was still that communal sense from the earlier decades of TV, but it was being applied to shows that were reaching higher and farther, and they were great. Damn it! You know, I think that if parents would spend less time worrying about what their kids watch on TV and more time worrying about what's going on in their kids' lives, this world would be a much better place. Yeah, I think that parents only get so offended by television because they rely on it as a babysitter and the sole educator of their kids. Totally, dude. Good point, man. <laughs> Quick! Jump through the window! <laughs> 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 